one. Aloha, everyone. Welcome back to a conversation with Joseph Aldo. Uh, my name is Kim Ann Curtin, a longtime friend and a client and student of Joseph's. Uh, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to talk with him and ask him questions about his journey. And this is a series of conversations with Joseph uh, that we thought might be a great thing for people who don't know Joseph to get to know him better and to learn about all his offerings, uh, included our personal sessions that he does with people, but he also is a holistic healer. And he also is a teacher and facilitator of learning how to use flower essence remedies. So Joseph, today we're gonna to talk a little bit about what a healer is, what that means to you, and also what it means to heal. Uh, I know you call yourself an intuitive uh, holistic healer, and a lot of people use that term, healer. So I'm really curious, you know, your perspective on it and or how you see it uh, for yourself and the journey you've had so far. Well, let's talk about <clears throat> what the word heal and healing means. And to heal means to become whole means to come complete within oneself. So when we are on a healing path, what we're doing is we are collecting those separate parts of ourselves and we're bringing them back together into an integrated whole within ourselves. So here we are in this world of duality and everything seems to be different from us or separate from us. But in reality, we are all connected. We are all interconnected. So as souls, we come into this world of seemingly different beings, an external versus an internal reality. And <clears throat> I'm just going to pin you. And we are being challenged to be able to return to the unity consciousness, to oneness, even though we are in the illusion of separation. So we embark as souls on a journey of human existence and human consciousness. And it's kind of a game, like a game of waking up. Can you wake up in a world that seems and find unity consciousness and connectedness in a world that seems so very separate from ourself to everybody else. <clears throat> and, you know, it's really challenging. It's very, very challenging to find this place of, I am the one who is connected to everything and creating everything from my own inner state of consciousness. So this world in front of us is my creation. But it's not just my creation, it's our creation as a whole, as a collective. So as each one of us returns to our state of wholeness, then we'll see that wholeness reflected back to us from the outside world. So one at a time, each one of us is waking up and healing ourselves. And each time one person does that, we add that quality of unity consciousness back into human consciousness so that we are more and more returning to a place of what we call heaven on earth. <clears throat> so we all embarked on this journey of separation that we may remember that we are all interconnected and one, and each one of us has our own unique path on this healing journey. And no two paths will ever look alike and no two journeys will ever be the same. So we have to navigate this terrain by tapping into our unique consciousness, our higher self, the one that is guiding us, that tells us what's the right path for us to take in each moment that we may fulfill our healing journey. And so <clears throat> on this healing journey, we seek out those who can support us in becoming whole and healed again. And this person is considered um, a healer. And like you said, this term is thrown around and, and used very uh, commonly and often, even though 
to really find a true healer, which is someone who has been initiated, someone who has been through the process of inner healing on all levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, that they have achieved a level of consciousness that is what can be considered emptiness. Mm -hmm. Because in the emptiness is where healing is happening, not in someone's idea, in someone's mind, in someone's agenda for what is healing for somebody else, but in the empty space of our consciousness, there is an unfolding that happens. There's an alchemy that happens because I am not interfering with the other person's process. I am simply observing and holding space for their process. So to become a healer, one, for me at least, one must go through various gates of initiation, various death processes, where they let go of their limited perception of reality, and they're able to embrace the greater reality with a capital R and the greater truth with a capital T. It's not my truth or my reality, it is the truth and the reality. Just like the universal laws and spiritual principles, not something that I came up with. It is what exists. These are laws, laws that no one can change, no one can interfere with. They are in within existence and they govern all of reality. So would, would you be willing before you go on, I hate to interrupt you, but for those who want to understand unity consciousness more, can you just give us your own definition of unity consciousness? So I've talked about the old paradigm and the new paradigm. The old paradigm is a fear-based paradigm, a separate, you know, separative perspective paradigm. And the new paradigm, uh, which is not new, it's simply new in relationship to the old, but it is, it is a paradigm that exists always. And all you have to do is shift your consciousness to be in this new paradigm, which is based in love and based in interconnectedness based in I and you are related. We are brothers and sisters. We are from the same tribe. Mm -hmm. And so unity consciousness is the realization of this new paradigm that we are all one. We are all, we all arise from the same one consciousness, call it God, call it the universe, call it the one, whatever you wanna call it. We all arise from the same source from the same sun, from the same entity. We are all each an individual body, you know, cell in the body of source. <clears throat> so when, when you find that healer, who is a true healer, that person has gone through various levels of death and dissolution of the ego to be able to maintain unity consciousness. And in unity consciousness, many things will transpire within the healer who's holding space. It just happens within their consciousness. So it's not the healer is doing something to the person who is seeking healing. It is that the healer is present. And in that presence, something is transmitted. Something is passed on. And the healer doesn't even necessarily know it's happening because they're simply present, they're empty, they're not thinking, they're not trying to do anything because there's yeah. nothing to do because there's nothing wrong. And yeah. the healer who has been initiated knows that. So when the person comes for a healing or the group comes from it for a healing, there's nothing wrong with anyone the healer holds each person within their state of consciousness as already whole and healed. And because they're holding the person in that state of consciousness, it naturally unfolds. If the person has done enough of the inner work to receive that space holding, then a lot can happen in a very short period of time. If the person has more work to do, then the healing process will unfold at the speed at which it needs to unfold in order for the person to go through the process they need to go through because no one can skip any steps in this world. 
if there is karma to work through, no one, you know, yes, certain masters can take on some of the disciples' karma, but then there's always an obligation to the master when the, the disciple get, when the master takes that, that karma, then the disciple always owes something in a certain way. So I don't do anything like that per se. I hold space and I let the person unravel at the speed they need to unravel that because they have to fulfill their karmic path. Nobody can override karma. It's a law, the law of cause and effect. Anything we have done in all time and space is recorded. Every iota of action, good, bad, indifferent, any harm we've done to people, any, anything of benefit we've done to people, all of it is recorded in what's called the Akashic Records. So every soul has all of its incarnations, all of its actions, all of its behaviors, positive and negative, recorded in the Akashic Records. And so in a lifetime, we will take on a percentage of that karma to clear it. And oftentimes those who've come in to be healers will take on a tremendous amount of their karma in a lifetime in order to speed up the healing on the planet as, as well as in order to be birthed as a, um, we'll call it as a higher conscious being which essentially means that they go through the process in body to burn through so much, but also to bring through the gifts that they have um, accrued over lifetime. So when you clear up a lot of your karma in a lifetime, and then you have that space, what descends in that space is much of your spiritual abilities just drops into your being. And all of a sudden you have all these abilities, you have no idea where they came from. Well, they came from many incarnations of practicing and uh, learning as an adept for this specific moment in time where you can become perhaps a master or an enlightened one. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, it's like, you know, I light the candle of the next person next to me and they light the candle of the person next to them. So we begin to wake and support each other in awakening and clearing and healing. And therefore we raise the level of consciousness on the planet so that we may ascend to the next level of consciousness. That's a lot of information, I know. Yeah, it's, 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 it, it's something, you know, that this has been a conversation we've had a few times and I can't help but think back to the book, Power Versus Force. Uh, which spoke to that those people who are operating at a higher level of consciousness are sort of uh, carrying, holding the, the world uh, on behalf of, you know, so many that are not quite as awake. And it, it just, it was an incredible kind of mind shift to read that book at the same time I was meeting you and realizing, wow, that, you know, some of the challenges I've had and the pain that I've gone through could could kind of be potentially uh, transmuted and or transformed into being uh, a conduit, hopefully for more healing uh, for just anybody that I come across that, that that pain would not be suffered or the struggles would not be suffered in vain. Uh, it, it was, it was up somewhat uplifting to feel that way, even just with the clients I work with, you know, seeing that, wow, my ability to navigate that myself at whatever journey I've had, then I can be able to hold space for somebody else. It's like that, that ripple effect, domino effect, like what you said about lighting the candle. Yeah. You know, just us walking around in the world at a higher state of consciousness where we surrendered our fear, where we surrender our anger, where we surrender our resentments. When we walk into the world with an open heart, then everywhere we go, we are radiating like the sun radiates sunlight. We are radiating that unity consciousness so that others may benefit from that without even being aware of it or knowing it. Um, and so because everything is energy and we are energy, 
when we achieve a level of consciousness we'll call that is love-based or unconditionally loving, then our presence makes a difference in the world without doing a thing, without doing anything. Everything else is an extra. But just to achieve that level of consciousness, we are being of service to humanity. I think about the Himalayan masters who are sitting you know, in the caves in the Himalayas and you know, their presence is impacting all of us and may even be maintaining consciousness on this planet so we don't, you know, destroy ourselves with all the things that we do that is so unconscious and warring and fighting. And, yeah. you know, like these high level beings perhaps could be stabilizing this whole planet. So, you know, what we do in the healing process really does, as you say, domino effect and impact everybody in the world and also especially our family lineage. Like mm. the ones who are awake and conscious in the family are doing a lot of the healing work for everyone in the family. So everyone gets the benefits of our individual healing work in our family. And it's all transmitted via DNA. Mm. Tell us and more I, about that. Tell us I more have about seen that. it time and time again within my family. Like whenever I go through one of these major shifts Everybody else in my family is doing better. I can't prove it. I can't explain it. I can just feel it in my body. Like, like people, like my mother is doing so great at 82 years old. And, you know, she'll contact me one day and um, she goes, oh, I just finished doing a headstand. And I'm like, headstand? When did you start doing yoga? Oh, I've been doing yoga for the past five years, watching Wailana on TV. And I'm like, holy mackerel, like how did, I've been doing yoga, you know, for 30 plus years and I, I never really told her anything about it, but she picks it up somewhere and she's doing it at the same time. And I'm like, okay, there is the proof that my self care is transmitting to my mother or the fact that she now eats quinoa and kale for breakfast <laughs> rather than Stella Doro cookies and, and coffee. <laughs> like, I'm like, you're eating what for breakfast, Ma? And she's like, yeah, the quinoa and the kale from last night I'm eating. And I'm like, who eats quinoa and kale for breakfast? An immigrant from Italy. I mean, not typical. So no, no. <laughs> I can see that she is totally absorbing the benefits of mm. all the inner work that I've done. And, you know, like she's supposed to have open heart surgery 12 years ago for an aneurysm, for an aortic aneurysm. And I said, yeah, no, that's not going to happen, mother. I said, just give me, just give me a day or two. I'm going to figure some things out. And I went online, did some research, and I saw what minerals were lacking. I said, I'm going to give you some minerals to take on a daily basis, very inexpensive. And I said, in six months, go back. You should be fine. And she did exactly that, went back, and uh, the aneurysm shrunk. Wow. No need for open heart surgery, wow. which could have killed her. Oh, so Joseph. here we are 12 years later, still no open heart surgery. She is doing absolutely fine. Wow. So that's just, that's a direct result, meaning like I stepped in to yeah. prevent her from having an operation, which I thought she would not be able to survive. And she had another great 12 years of her life and she's thriving right now. Wow. So, you know, Everything that we develop and cultivate within ourselves, there is a benefit to all of humanity and especially our lineage. And it is our task to raise the vibration of our lineage because we are the ones who are awake, aware, and conscious of the greater reality, the greater whole. And so we are the healers, you know, the black sheep are the healers of the family, but they have to somehow take the reins and be able to do the inner work rather than caught up in the victimhood or the separation or I don't fit in, I don't belong. I've never fit in. I've never fit in pretty much anywhere. And it was only my inner voice said, you need to just stop trying to fit in. You're not here to fit in. You're here to create and generate a new paradigm. So enough with this. And I got it. I got like... I'm going to have to like attract my tribe rather than try to fit into a tribe. 
Yeah. Yep. I completely can relate to that. <laughs> and I completely can see how you over these eight years have uh, had to stay true to that and allow the chips to fall where they may. Uh, I think that takes, it takes a lot of courage in this world to uh, not force yourself to fit into the mold of another tribe. Uh, it really takes a discipline. Uh, you know, one of the things that I heard you say before, just about one's own personal journey and the impact it has on those around you, never mind your family or your lineage, uh, that I have also had incredible success with and experienced with uh, over and over, over again, many times I'd call you, speak to you, and you would tell me to do a cutting cords meditation uh, because that has been such a big part of my journey. Uh, would you be willing to maybe speak a little bit about that? Uh, it just inevitably would be something you would direct me towards. And I would, I'm still amazed at the power I find in that one exercise, so much healing for myself and for those usually involved in that cutting cords meditation that I, you know, will be present to. So at some point in time, uh, we begin to realize that we are in this dysfunctional relationship with someone else. It could be a family member, it could be someone that you've had a relationship with, an intimate relationship with and you can't get them out of your mind and they keep occupying your consciousness. You keep feeling like you're a victim of the relationship, angry at them, whatever it is, whatever the emotion that's arising. The cutting cords meditation allows us to complete the relationship in all time and space. Oftentimes when we encounter people, it's not the first time we encounter them when we're in relationships with them. We reincarnate over and over again, and we reconnect with the same souls over and over and over again. And oftentimes we have issues with certain souls and each lifetime we're trying to complete the journey with them. But it's hard to complete because each one is blaming the other for being the cause of their state of imbalance, their state of anger, upset, um, victimhood, grief, whatever it is. So when you do the cutting cords meditation, you call upon the higher self of the other person. And you say, I acknowledge that I am the creator. I have generated this relationship 100%. The only way you can heal is if you take 100% responsibility for being the creator of your existence, all of it no matter what you may perceive the other person did to you, you cannot heal until you take 100% responsibility for being the creator of the relationship. Once you acknowledge that, then all the words you say have power. So you can say to someone, um, thank you for being in my life and on this journey with me. I am so grateful for all the experiences I've had with you. I now choose to complete this relationship at this level in all time and space, past, present, and future. And because I wish to complete this relationship with you, it will be complete. And you call upon an archetype, the archetype of Archangel Michael, who holds a sword of truth. And this archetype hands this, the, the sword to you. And with this sword, you cut all cords of disempowerment between the two of you. And then you cut these cords. You don't, you never cut heart cords. It's only cords of disempowerment, cords of dysfunctionality. So the heart cords always remain. And so you cut the cords between the two of you and you visualize your cords coming back into your system and their cords going, going back to their system. And you bless them, you thank them, you bless them and you send them on their way. And what you've just done is you have reabsorbed your power. You no longer have that a part of yourself held in somebody else. You own it, you own everything, both the light and the dark of the relationship and therefore it is complete. One may need to do it a few times 
if, it, if someone keeps coming back in your consciousness and you are reacting to them, that's the key word, reacting. If you react to someone, you've got to do a cutting cords meditation because part of your energy is in, part of your power is in them. They're holding it for you, waiting for you to collect it back. And so you cut the cords and you feel a lightness of being. You don't have this intense energy with this person any longer. And oftentimes they will contact you within 24 hours because they feel, they feel the disconnect and they almost wanna pull it back because it's like, well, I know it's dysfunctional, but who will I be without this functional, this dysfunctional relationship? Like we become so familiar with something, even if it's uncomfortable, we don't wanna let it go. Yeah. But everybody is suffering in the relationship. So someone of consciousness who's awake and aware has to begin this process to end this back and forth. One lifetime, I'm the victimizer. Next lifetime, I'm the victim. The victim and the victimi victimizer are the shadow of each. And until we complete it and own that I am all of it, I am both the victim and I am the victimizer. I am everything in existence. See, the healer knows this. The healer knows there's nothing in existence that I am not. Therefore, the healer can hold and contain everything and anything somebody brings to them. Because they're holding unity consciousness, no separation, no otherness. Everything is interconnected and I am interconnected with all of it. And at some point in time, I have held every position, positive, negative, light, dark. What's there to judge? What's there to go against? There's nothing. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, amazing when you speak about the oneness of all. Uh, I'm reminded of, uh, I'm very fortunate to do outrigger paddling here in Hawaii. And we had an encounter, our six man canoe, with a whale and this whale came extraordinarily close to our canoe uh, and one of the gentlemen in front of me was doing a Hawaiian chant very unexpectedly this never never happened to me before with somebody doing that and this whale just came you know swimming right towards our canoe and you know they are so massive in size that I was very frightened, but I also was aware that if this is the way I was going out, what a way to go. <laughs> and when that creature was within 15 feet of our canoe, the energy coming off of it uh, was unity consciousness, Christ consciousness, complete oneness. I, I knew that it's and me were the same and just just a weeping a weeping i mean i'm sure everybody in the canoe was weeping but the, the there was such a force coming off of this of high wisdom of high consciousness that that sense of oneness was palpable uh and i feel that that's the joy and the healing i have by being in a place like hawaii you're so close to nature you're so close to uh, the creatures of the ocean and the world, that it seems to be easier here to connect to that consciousness. For those who don't live in Hawaii, for those that perhaps are in cities, uh, for those who are perhaps in households where they don't have that sense of freedom or uh, connection, what would you suggest for them? How do they get their cup filled of tasting that unity consciousness? Mm. That's a good question. Well, first and foremost, you have to plug in. You know how you plug in the toaster oven, you know, the toaster to the socket, and then, you know, then you have, it It works, it heats up. So in order for us to remember who we are, we have to plug in on a regular basis to source. We have to do various practices that keep us connected to unity consciousness, to the oneness, and help us to navigate this world without getting caught up in the illusion of separation. So there are mantras. I was given a mantra in Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii. Uh, yeah, that's a different mantra. I was given mantra in India when I went in 2001. Um, 
I was just walking around the complex at the Himalayan Institute and somebody said, we're going to be giving mantras by the great tree, whatever the tree was. And my inner voice said, like screamed, go, this is why you came here. Wow. And I went there and they gave me the Gayatri mantra. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I am truly blessed that I was present in that moment to hear that um, offering because for the past almost 20 years, I've been doing this mantra and it really has transformed my existence. Tell us how you do your mantras and how we could do our own. Well, um, so usually a mantra is passed on to you by a teacher, by someone who's been doing it, someone who is well-versed in the mantra. Oftentimes we're given mantras that we've been doing for lifetimes. So we simply come back into the wave of the mantra. It is like our, it is like, you know, like in the middle of the ocean or yeah, when someone's in the ocean and they see the, the, the lighthouse light, they have the direction when the fog, they can see that lighthouse so that they know where they're coming close to the shore. So a mantra helps us to, especially this Gayatri mantra, helps one to release much of the samskaric, the karmic residue that we have collected over lifetimes, at the same time enlightening our consciousness to the truth. So I can be very stressed out in a day and I just sit down and I do a round, which is 108 mala beads. I do a round of the mantra and it's like, I, I took a nice long nap and I come back refreshed, clear, clean, and you know, bright eyed. So when you do a mantra regularly, it speeds up your evolution as it purifies your consciousness and releases the muck of, your, of our existence. But you know, one usually is given that by someone who is in a place of authority, uh, a teacher, a seer, um, a healer. And when you're given that mantra, it behooves you to use it because it is a gift from God um, that you may return to source uh, on a regular basis and release the, the dross of this third dimensional existence that we can accumulate each and every day just by going out because we're all energetic beings. We can accumulate a lot of data in our energy fields. And so using a mantra helps to really purify our consciousness of the, the advertisement, the propaganda, the whatever it is that keeps seeping into our consciousness so that our, our connection to source remains pure and our intuition and our capacity to hear and feel and receive is always active and activated so that we are forever being guided on our path and that we don't lose our way. Mm -hmm. So the mantra is a very important tool um, for maintaining that connection, but also a simple visualization of tuning into, like allowing the light of consciousness to descend into the top of your head, moving down your spine and into your whole body so that every cell in your body you visualize receives the light of consciousness. This is real. When you are seeing something inside of your mind's eye, you are seeing and creating reality. So when I see a light coming into my body and filling my whole being, that every cell is being juiced up, charged, plugged in, that's what's happening. And when I see like the dross of existence, the toxins move out of my body and into the earth, that's what's happening. It's real. So some people might say, well, we're just imagining all this stuff when we're visualizing. No, you're actually creating when you're visualizing. You're actually creating when you say words. Every word we utter has a vibration and steps and create and steps into creation creating reality creating this reality creating this reality all of us have the power of the spoken word and we are creating continuously and that's why we have to be so careful with our words and our thoughts because 
everything is being heard. Everything is being followed. And so we meditate. We say these mantras that our mind may be purified and only have pure thoughts. Because once I learned this the hard way, that our thoughts are real and have an impact on people. When I was uh, early on on my path, I had a session with one of my teachers and she really pissed me off. Some Something was, she pressed a button of mine that really set me off. And so I went to my garden afterwards and I'm like cursing her out, calling her a bitch. And how dare she say these things to me? And I just like let it out. And I went upstairs and, you know, in those days, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, there was, um, you know, like you can leave a message on a machine. So I got into my apartment and I saw a blinking red light and I pressed, you know, play message. And there was my teacher saying, hey, Joe, it's Melissa. Just wanted to let you know that you're sending psychic dogs my way. And um, just want to let you know. Have a great day. Bye bye. And I'm like. I'm sending psychic dogs her way. And I was mortified that she could hear, feel, sense what I was sending forth. So I called her immediately and I apologized. I said, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I did not mean to send you that. She goes, oh, it's just, you know, you're just projecting your mother's stuff on me. It's okay. I'm protected by my guides. I just wanted you to know. Wow. So imagine if I did that to somebody who wasn't protected. Yeah. Imagine the power our thoughts have on people when we send them negative psychic dogs. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I can't help but think, especially in the culture we're in right now at this time and place in history and those that we disagree with, that there probably are a lot of psychic dogs happening all over the place. Uh, towards, you know, a lot of different people, especially some in politics. And yet, uh, there is a cumulative effect uh, is, is really what I'm hearing you're saying. And, you know, that, you know, it, in fact, one of the quotes from you that I had brought to this conversation was you, sp you speak about whether or not we live in a fear-based reality when you have, when you will have experiences that reflect fear-based thinking, but if you live from a love-based reality, you will experience and have experience that reflect this. And I can't help but think of that quote right now regarding, you know, that moment you're coming away from somebody angry, upset, frustrated, and yet what is it that helps you stay in that place? Even the way your teacher spoke to you on that voicemail, she wasn't making you wrong. <laughs> she was just pointing out and she wasn't even triggered by it, but she was like identifying, hey, this is what you're doing and this is a real thing. So you might wanna be conscious of it. That is a really amazing you know, window into that place of coming from a love-based reality. Yeah, she's a she's a true teacher that she didn't react and make me wrong or put me down, but just, you know, lovingly, gently informing me without even telling me, like, your thoughts have power. Like, I got all of that from the contemplation of just being like, damn, she picked up my thoughts to a T. And I best be very aware next time I have thoughts mm -hmm. because thoughts are powerful. They're energy. They get to their destination. And, you know, that's why we need teachers. We need, we need master teachers to help us on our path because we can be so dense. You know, we can be really dense and indignant and want to be right and righteous. And you can see it with this whole political party of Democrats versus Republicans, this one versus that one. And it's like, you know, we just keep perpetuating that, defi that divisive energy and it is cutting. It is brutal. It is harmful. And whatever you send forth comes back to you manifold. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Whatever yes. I send forth 
It's like a boomerang. Yes. I'm throwing something out and it will always return to me, but faster. Yes. More intensely. And yes. so I learned that early on in life. And I that's why I chose to no longer blame anyone for the experiences that I'm having, but to do the inner work every time I react to something outside of me and to mm -hmm. take my power back rather than to blame someone else for being the cause mm -hmm. of my life. Nobody is the cause. Everybody is a catalyst. Once you get that, game over on that level. There's nothing to blame. There's no one to make fault, not even yourself. It's just like, oh, more work to do. Let me sit down. <laughs> let me sit. Let me just observe all of my judgments about this person. And let me write down what's really upsetting about me and purge it. But don't purge your stuff on another person because yeah. it just comes back to us. And that's what the whole thing is about this world is, is this world is a reflection. This third dimensional reality is a program. And the program is you're going to receive what you put forth. It's really, really simple. You put forth lack consciousness, you're going to get back lack. You put forth fear, you're going to get everything that you're afraid of. You put forth love, you're going to get back love. It's really that simple. And you're the one that has to observe each day what's working for me, what's not working for me. Keep doing what's working and then work on what's not working. But you got to get to the subconscious programming to be able to integrate what's not working. Because you can say all you want, I receive the abundance I am. That's the conscious mind saying an affirmation. But if the subconscious mind says, I am not worthy at all to receive abundance, you have a contradictory program going here. So you, you affirm your abundance, but you have the exact opposite vector operating in the background, which cancels out your capacity to be abundant can be very, very frustrating. But once you, you start excavating the subconscious mind, you will be blown away at how much information is in there that opposes all the things you want to experience consciously. Yeah, yeah, undoubtedly. And, and to do that work and to be willing to go and look at those thoughts that are driving you, that you would rather not be driving you, I think, asks for uh, a lot of courage. And I think it's very hard to do it by yourself in a vacuum, uh, which is why I think it's so important to have uh, somebody like yourself to help accompany uh, them on the journey. Uh, I, I feel, you know, and, and there are many times when I've reached out to you over these years uh, where I really didn't like what you had to say. You know, <laughs> I was annoyed by it. I was triggered by it. I felt frustrated with, you know, what was being spoken, but I could always see that your motive was in service to my leveling up. And, you know, anytime you want to level up, you're going to have to do kind of the boot camp to get to that next level. So, you know, it was kind of like uh, calling up, uh, what is it called in, in, in the, is it, it's boot camp, your drill sergeant. <laughs> there would be yeah. times when I was like, you know, uh, one of our mutual friends, Shakuntala, I'd be like, Shakuntala, I'm gonna call Joseph. And I really don't want to right now <laughs> because he's gonna, he's gonna be the drill sergeant on me, but I know I have to do it. And she's just like, I'll be here afterwards to give you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and true. yet you were not coming from a place of wanting to, you know, hurt me, but you were like, you can do this. You must do this. You know, you have it in you. And that holding that kind of space and calling me forth uh, is why I believe I've been able to level up at the level I'm at now. And I know there's always more, but it's a lot better than the other levels I was on, Joseph. So thank you. Thank you for uh, always calling me forth. Very grateful to you for that. Yeah. Well, I always say you pulled me into your existence, literally off the dance floor. You <laughs> pulled me at Five Rhythms that day. And some part of you recognized, 
like there's something about this guy. And I, I mean, there's plenty of people in that room dancing in Five Rhythms in New York City. Why did you zero in on me and then hold on for dear life? Like your soul knew if I'm going to do what I'm here to do, I'm going to need help and I'm going to need some serious help. And this like Italian Sicilian Brooklyn guy <laughs> somehow is going to help me do it come hell or high water. And yeah, I am definitely an intense being. And, but you know, it depends. It depends on what yes, someone yeah. presents to me. Cause yes, a lot yeah. of people get TLC, a lot of, <coughs> a lot of, you know, loving point. kind words, but yeah, other people yeah. need a nice swift kick in the ass. <laughs> exactly. And I needed that switch kick a few times. Exactly, because you begin to wallow in victimhood. Yes, for sure. And when you go there, there's no game. It's over. Yeah. There's, there's no chi. There's no energy to work with. So yeah. you need someone to kind of work on the oppositional level that you're operating on to kind of like wake, wake up. up. It's, not, it's like it's like the... Uh, Remember Moonstruck, where Cher slaps Nicholas Cage? Snap out of it. Snap out of it. <laughs> and yeah. that's exactly what was happening for me uh, on the you know early journey part of my life. You you were like, snap out of it. You're in a headspace that's not empowered and is going to keep you from going where you can go. And it was hard to hear. And at the same time, I was starving to hear those words, hungry, hungry, hungry to hear those words. And uh, and that's why we're still in each other's lives all these years later. <laughs> exactly, you were up for the task, even though your personality, your ego was like, I don't, I can't even imagine how I'm gonna, how I'm gonna do this. How am I gonna do this? How am I gonna, how am I gonna do what he's telling me to do? And yep. that's what I call cliff jumping. You know, I'm the, people can get to the cliff and then they find me to be like, go, jump off the cliff. Well, where am I going? How do I do it? There's nothing to do. You just take a step. Where am I taking a step to? Nowhere. <laughs> what does that mean? It means nothing. <laughs> How do I do it? You take a step. I don't oh. understand. There's nothing to understand. <laughs> Let go of trying to figure out how yeah. you're going. You've done all the figuring out up to the point of the cliff. Yes. At yes. that moment, there's no more tools. Yeah. There's no more doing. You just yeah. jump. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the hardest place for many people to yeah. get to. Because the fear kicks in. The yeah, unknown. Sure. Who for will sure. I be? What's going to yeah. happen? What if no one's there to catch me? What if, what if, what if? And, and, the, and the intellect, I, I think especially for those who are cerebral, who have a tendency to uh, intellectualize their way out of challenges all along their lives and read all the books, which I am prone to do, uh, we want to think our way out of that. And you, you know, ultimately your, your assignment was to not rely upon that part of ourselves, but to lean deeply into our soul, soulfulness, our spirit, and to trust that as the, as the uh, director of this journey. And that is, uh, you know, it's, it's a very unsettling, <laughs> it's very unsettling to step off and wait for the net to appear. You want to see the net first before you jump. And you're like, you can't see the net unless you jump. And that's like such a mind twist that it's hard. But it wouldn't be an initiation if it was easy. And, you know, we study, we read books, we take courses. They all get us to the edge of the cliff. Yeah. Before we jump, we turn around and we sit there and we build a fire. <laughs> and we burn the books. Yeah. We burn the degrees. We burn the courses. We burn all of that third dimensional knowledge. It's no longer of use to get off the cliff. It'll actually hold us back mm -hmm. from the infinite wisdom that is awaiting us. To be initiated, you have to die to that self that got you there. Mm -hmm. And it's frightening to let go of all of those things 
that you've identified with as yourself. Mm -hmm. And so when Rumi met Shams of Tabriz, and he, you know, he was, you know, in Konya, and he was in the middle of uh, a square by a water fountain, and Shams saw him, recognized him, and knew he was the person he was looking for. He went to Rumi, he took all of his books from his father and forefathers and threw them into the fountain. And Rumi's looking at these books and he's like, what have you done? What have you done? This is, this goes back eons. It's my father's and my grandfather's and this information is priceless. And Sham says, you want it? I will give it back to you just as I threw it in. And in that moment, Rumi recognized that if he took that back, he would remain small. He would remain limited. He would remain just a shadow of who he is, of his lineage. So in that moment, he said, no, let it be. And in that moment, he jumped off the cliff. And Shams showed him the way to the infinite. Mm. So when you meet the teacher, you're going to have to give up a lot in order to receive the teachings. To receive it all, I would say, though. You give up a lot to receive it all. Yeah. And so this is a lifetime of many deaths, of many letting goes. And I don't think we've seen even a tenth of what's going to unfold before us in this time frame, in this point of shifting consciousness on the planet. So one has to really be able to cliff jump because we're going to be met with all of our fears to the nth degree. Like, look at this, the fear of this virus, right? Mm -hmm. How many people are in such fear of this virus? I have no fear whatsoever. I have no concerns whatsoever. Why is that? Does it not exist? No, I just have nothing to fear about it. I can't tell you why. There's just nothing in my being that says I need to be concerned. I also know how the body works. I also know how to heal. So anything arises, I know how to take care of my body. I have the information. But the average person is in a great state of fear right now of contracting some disease. That's a lot of power, a lot of loss of power. And so as we begin to trust, that jumping off the cliff is trusting in the invisible, in the infinite, in the unknown to hold you. And then once you master that trust, then all of a sudden something else happens, which I won't go into at this moment in time because you have to first learn how to jump before you can learn the next steps. But it yeah. truly is an incredible existence once you learn how to surrender your fears, how to surrender your limited mind, how to surrender your identity and the construct you've created of who you think you are in this world. All of it is a box. It's all a box. And you've all painted yourselves into a box. Somehow you gotta break that box open so that you can actually fully realize the truth of who you are as an infinite soul in this limited body, which is not limited actually. It's beyond the beyond, but one has to get to the place of letting go of limited thinking and perception in order to realize this body as actually an infinite entity. Joseph, thank you. This is an amazing conversation today. Uh, I'm looking forward to the other episodes. We're doing a series here with Joseph Aldo. Uh, let's just tell the viewers where they can find you, Joseph, uh, if they want to do either sessions with you or they want to learn how to do flower essences. Uh, please tell them where they can find you and your books. Uh, I'm at josephaldo.com. 
and the books are Holistic Healing and the Shifting Paradigm, In an Ecstatic State, and The Voice Within, which is in the works as we speak. Beautiful. Can't wait for that book to come out. We'll see you guys in the next episode. We have a couple more episodes to go where we're going to learn from Joseph and get to share in the wisdom he's gathered over these many, many years. Thank you, Joseph, for letting me be in this conversation with you. It's my honor to be here with you. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.